Would Officer Robert R. Howell and Michael P. Carroll please come forward? On March 6, 2008, Officer Rob Howell and Mike Carroll respond to a burglary in progress at a home over in the Dayton's Bluff neighborhood of St. Paul. While they were interviewing the victims for more information, they saw something a little unusual. Even for St. Paul, this would count as, I think, unusual. Uh, they saw a man standing in the middle of the street, swinging a large samurai sword over his head. Now, you don't see that every day in St. Paul. Um, and if it was any doubt that this person was completely out of control, uh, he decided that the squad car window somehow had offended him, and he began smashing at the squad car window with the sword. Uh, Howell and Carroll went outside, ordered the suspect to drop the weapon, uh, and he refused, and very quickly we went from what might be kind of a comical situation to a deadly force encounter of, of the worst possible kind. Uh, over the years, um, cops have been trained that People with edge weapons stand an absolutely mortal danger to them. Um, we used to train when I was in training, we used to tell people when, when you're engaged with somebody with a knife, uh, it is not a matter of when you're going to get cut, it's just how many times and how badly you're going to get cut. Uh, and that those cuts are almost always fatal and, and almost always leave permanent injuries is, is truly one of the things that, that scares, scares cops to death. As they approached the, uh, the suspect, the officers noticed that the suspect not only had the samurai sword in one hand, but was armed with a knife in his other hand. Uh, repeatedly, they ordered the suspect to stop and drop his weapons. Not only did the suspect not comply with the orders, but he continued moving forward. Um, you've got two cops armed, poised, giving clear verbal commands, and yet he continues to move forward. Samurai sword in hand, knife in hand, he continues to move forward. Officer Howell, while, while, while really being the closest in, in, in proximity to the, to the, to the man, uh, saw him begin not just swinging the sword now, but literally slashing at him with the sword. Uh, and Officer Howell was forced to fire his service weapon to stop the suspect. But this tells you how, how out of it this, this man really was. Uh, despite being hit by 40 caliber rounds, all that did was slow him down. He dropped to a knee, still holding the sword, still holding the knife. And despite being wounded and ignoring the commands of the officer, he stood and again began to close on the officers. Howell and Carroll both ordered the man to stop again and he again refused and Officer Carroll then was forced to use deadly force to protect himself and others from harm. Once the suspect was down, the officer secured his weapons and rendered first aid to him until the medics arrived. Howell and Carroll demonstrated great courage, great empathy and composure during this life-threatening encounter. And I'm pleased to today award St. Paul's highest honor, the Medal of Valor, to Officers Rob R. Howell and Officer Michael P. Carroll. Thank you all for coming, and thanks to the chief for holding this and the help he got from Angela, Julie. I really appreciate all the work you've done also. Lori, thank you. Uh, it was a tough day out there, and we did get a lot of uh, good words and support from everyone since then. It's, it's really appreciated, just like this is appreciated now, having you all here. I never expected to be here. I've usually worked these. Uh, venues as a security officer or doorman on the outside looking in so uh, I never expected to be here here I am thank you all for that uh, like I said there was a lot of people that uh, came to our assistance afterwards and rendered us support uh, the many months that followed and first off was my wife 
Doris, she was very helpful and we went through a lot through these months. Um, I'd also like to thank the officers at Eastern District, especially Ed Dion, Kathy O'Reilly, uh, very helpful to me, uh, Ed's partner and ex-Federate, uh, currently current uh, central officer, uh, Jesse Mulner. I'd also like to thank a couple of the uh, investigators who were first on the scene and rendered us a lot of assistance through these months. Uh, Fred Gray, John Linson, I appreciate it very much. Um, and I'd especially like to thank the sergeant that was on duty that day, uh, Sergeant Axel Henry. He's been a huge help to me and as a result to my family. And he did much of it on his own time. Very much appreciated, Ax. Thank you. Um, and finally, just uh, I didn't know exactly where I was going to get the inspiration for what I had to say up here today. So I thought back to the most recent, most recent Medal of Valor uh, ceremony that we had in January. I thought back to uh, an officer that I really have a lot of respect for, Bill Baudet of the Eastern District. He got up here, said a few words, and uh, heartfelt words, and then left. And I thought to the, another officer that was here, a retired officer, James, Mc, James Mann. And I thought, uh, well, whose uh, inspiration should I follow here? And uh, <laughs> I thought it was best to go with Bill Baudet on this. And I just want to say thank you. <laughs> One more time. Thank you. Uh, that, that day was a stressful day. Um, and I, too, have a few people that I want to thank. Uh, first and foremost, when you're recognized for a job well done, you know it's not as an individual. It's a team effort. And so let me introduce you to my team. The first person I'd like to thank is uh, Range Master and Firearms Instructor of the St. Paul Police Department. That would be Randy Barnett and his staff. Uh, without that training that I received uh, back in the academy starting in 97, um, I, was, I didn't really handle any weapons before then. So I'd like to thank uh, uh, Randy Barnett and his staff for their training over the years. Uh, second of all, I'd like to thank the uh, first officers on scene. And it was chaotic that day, and I, I may f forget a few, but uh, I remember a couple of motors units uh, arriving on the scene. I believe it was Todd Borkman and um, Matt Arntzen. I'd like to thank you guys for showing up and r helping out. Uh, Sergeant Gray was one of the first ones to arrive and helped out a great deal. Thank you, sir. Uh, a big thanks to officers Ed Dion and Jesse Molner. At, after that incident, officer-involved shooting, things get pretty chaotic and get pretty confusing. And there's things that have to take place afterwards. Um, and being involved in that, you kind of get caught up in the moment and forget, you know, you try to remember exactly what just happened. You're trying to file it away so you, when you write out reports later, you don't forget to um, include something that's very important. And so I'd like to thank Jesse and uh, Ed for their very much, their, their very support. Uh, I'd also like to thank Investigator Scott Payne for uh, keeping me informed of everything that happened afterwards. Um, thank you very much, Scotty. Uh, and the chief, I'd like to thank Chief Harrington and his command staff uh, for all their support afterwards and during that time. Um, I also like to thank the, uh, my brothers and sisters in blue, especially those uh, on the east side, particularly um, East Tour 2. Thank you so much for having my back. Um, there's four more people that I have to recognize before I leave the podium this morning. And the four people, when I call your name, could you please stand and be recognized? The first person, um, there are four ladies, and they're very, I hope I don't get too emotional, but I feel it coming already. <sighs> the four very important women in my life. The first one being my mother. Rachel Hall, would you please stand? These are, these are four very beautiful people. Um, for obvious reasons, but let me tell you a few other reasons why they're beautiful. 
Uh, my mother from day one has always instilled in me um, Christian values and I take them with me every day. Um, you know when we strap on this uniform, put on the badge and all the other gear that goes with it, we're not alone. I don't know how many of you believe in a higher power or, or your God, but uh, my mother does and she instilled that in me. And every morning she prays for myself. I have a brother that's a LAPD, she prays for him. And she prays for each and every one of you every day. And for that mom, you're beautiful. second person that's uh, very beautiful to me is my wife, Jane Howell. Would you please stand? Now this one will be a little shorter because if I told you all the things that she's done for me and why I am the man I am today and the police officer I am today, we'd be here forever. It's just too long a list. But uh, one thing I can tell you is that none of us is promised tomorrow. You know, it could be taken away from us at any time. So each morning before I leave, go to work in the morning, we tell each other, I love you today. And we leave it at that until we see each other later that night. And so for that, you're beautiful. Thank you. My firstborn, my beautiful daughter, Alina, would you please stand? You're very independent. <laughs> Thank you for your teen years not making them so stressful on me. Thank you for your college freshman year. Wasn't quite that stressful, but thank you. Thank you for being self-sufficient, putting yourself through school. I really appreciate that. <laughs> and for many more other qualities, you're very beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> now this next one and last one, I'm not going to get through. Andrea Howe, would you please stand? Andrea, you are so special to me. Your uniqueness, your innocence, you're very special. And let me tell you why. And those of you that know her already know why, but let me share it with everyone else. Every morning, every morning when I leave and I'm wearing this uniform, she says, Dad, I love you. Be careful. And she means it. Quickly followed by, tell Nick be careful, tell Brady be careful, tell Fred be careful, tell Reno be careful, and everyone she can name until I lock that door behind me. And if those of you who took the time out today to get to know her, introduce yourself to her, well, it's going to take me just a little bit longer to get out that door every morning. So. <laughs> For that, Andrea, you're very beautiful. Everybody, thank you very much. Sergeant Ann M. Bebo, please come forward. On July 21st, 2008, Sergeant Ann Bebo was running through downtown St. Paul. Now, for those of you that know Annie knows that she's always running someplace. Uh, but in this case, we're quite literally talking about she's out for a jog. Uh, and she's in the area near 12th and Wabasha. Now, officers in St. Paul uh, work out, well, some of us work out regularly. Others of us uh, probably haven't seen the gym quite as often as we should. Uh, but 
it's a good thing to stay in shape and to uh, relieve the stresses of the job nonetheless. As she was running down the street, she saw a car drive by in which the occupants appeared to be fighting. Uh, I want you to think about the situational awareness. Most of us, you know, we're out, got the headphones on, we're just kind of one foot in front of the other, trying to remember how to breathe. Uh, but Annie's got the, the wherewithal to not only do all of those things, but to actually notice what's going on around her. Uh, just as she is seeing the car drive by, the car suddenly comes to a stop and a juvenile male ran from the car. Now, the young man was being chased by a, an adult male who uh, came out of the car, and once again, one of those things you don't see every day, armed with an aluminum baseball bat. Uh, Sergeant Bebo saw the adult strike the youth with the bat several times. Um, it, it truly is uh, one of those horrific assaults that, that you, you, you think it, you can't be seeing what you're seeing, but in fact you are. The suspect then threw the bat aside and pushed the youth to the ground and began to punch him repeatedly in the face. Now, I don't know how many of you, when you go out jogging, carry your gun, your badge, your pack set, your bulletproof vest, your ASP, and all the other equipment that we, we carry around with us, but Annie didn't on that day have all of the, that equipment. She had no police identification with her. She didn't have any of her weapons, none of her equipment, not even a cell phone with her to assist her or protect her. But Sergeant Bebo recognized that if she did not stop the assault, this boy was going to not only be badly injured, but maybe this boy was going to be killed. And Sergeant Bebo then approached the suspect, who was in a violent rage. Uh, and was much larger than she was, and she ordered him to stop. The man continued to strike the youth in the head and the face, and fearing for the child's safety, Annie grabbed the bat and struck the adult's arm in an attempt to stop him. Now, at least that got his attention. Um, and the suspect now turned his rage on Sergeant Bebo. I want you to picture that. You're, you're standing in the middle of the street. You don't know. It's, it's not like a normal call where you know backup's coming, typically, that you can get on the radio and go, go signal 13. Uh, you don't know that anybody else knows you're out here. You don't know what's going to happen. All you know is that if you don't step up, bad things are going to happen. They've already happened, and they're going to continue to get worse if you don't step up. So despite his rage, despite his size, despite her, her vulnerability at that point, uh, she grabbed them and pulled him off of the kid. Uh, just literally, physically had to muscle him off of this kid who he's beating. Um, she warned the suspect that she was an officer and he responded uh, to tell that he was gonna bust her head open. Uh, this is just how violent the rage he was in. Uh, because of Annie's intervention though, the juvenile victim was able to get up and he took off at a run. Uh, and now the suspect was left with Annie as the focus of his rage. He took off though. Uh, he took off after the juvenile and Annie was, had the presence of mind to stop a car, um, grab somebody who had a cell phone and call in the cavalry, uh, which came very quickly, arrested the suspect. Uh, I just to think about what, what it's like to be out there by yourself. Um, a lot of us do this job as a team uh, and that's, that's how we want us to do this job. Uh, but there are moments in our career whether it's you're the first one through the door, uh, like the canine guys often are, you're out in the woods tracking somebody, or you're on that traffic stop out in the, the non-busy parts of our city, and you're out there by yourself with a madman who is bent on beating you and hurting you and possibly killing you. I want you to think about the courage it takes to stand in the face of that kind of rage and that kind of danger. And I want you to think about Annie Bebo when you think of that. Uh, because, because of her selfless actions that day, uh, that child was saved from further injury. Uh, the bad guy got caught. Uh, and I'm pleased today to award St. Paul's highest honor, the Medal of Valor, to Sergeant Ann M. Bebo. challenged. Um, I just want to thank everybody for being here today and I think a true measure of our blessings is when we can look into a room full of people and see a lot of friends and family that care about us and uh, I feel truly blessed today. I know there's a lot of other things people could be doing today than be here. They have piles of work on their desk. It never seems to end and I'm very um, very honored that people made the choice to be here today. Um, 
you know, I, I grew up on the east side of St. Paul and we have certain values over there. And one of the things we have a value about is not seeing um, vulnerable people being hurt. And I think that's kind of an east side value. And when I came on the St. Paul Police Department, um, I always liked to hang around with the ones we called the old salty dogs and gain from their wisdom. And one of them said to me one day, they said, um, God takes care of uh, puppy, dro puppy dogs, little kids, and drunks. And it, has, it, it had a meaning for me uh, that these are the vulnerable people in our society and these are things that we need to care about too because our highest commander in chief uh, cares about those things. I have to always also thank um, all the people that have been there during the training phases of my career. Actually, it's always ongoing. Um, back in the academy, um, John Harrington was a sergeant at the time, and one of the things he taught in there was report writing, and he had asked us one day, uh, what's your most powerful weapon that you have? And we were all coming up with different answers, like, well, it's your gun, you know? And he said, well, no, that's not right. And we kept going and asking questions. And he said, he pulled out his pen and he said, it's your pen and it has to do about report right. But I, I thought maybe he was thinking this was a weapon of opportunity. <laughs> 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 but it got me thinking at the time because sometimes, like for instance, in this, in this deal, we don't have any equipment and we have to think about things like weapons of opportunity. And although I didn't start out with one, a bat was presented to me. And we have really good training on this department and we've had for years, we're taught things like, you know, there really isn't such a thing as luck, but if there were such a thing as luck, it happens when opportunity and preparation come together. And we're trained to handle this kind of stuff. And I would like to think that any one of my brothers and sisters in blue would have done the same thing. And uh, as cops, we're really blessed to have a second family. We come into one family and then we're born into the second one. And um, this is how we roll. This is what we do best, I think. Um, and I don't know if people know this, but at 12th and Wabasha, it's a very special place and it always has been to me. That's where our law, enf law enforcement memorial is. And the names on that stone are some of my brothers that have lost their lives in the line of duty. And when I go running, I like to go by that law enforcement memorial. And um, when I get to the memorial, I'll always stop and walk through there. And I silently thank them for what they've given for us to be here today. And the badge is really a thing of honor. And we have to make a decision every day about how we live our lives, that we honor the sacrifices they have given by how we choose to do our work today. Um, when this whole thing happened, I have to be honest with you, the first thing I thought is I had a little conversation with God right there and I said, why not, why me, why not Dean Keenan? <laughs> <laughs> He's the biggest guy I can think of. In fact, we've had conversations about he should probably get like extra pay because just one entree at a meal isn't enough, you know? <laughs> to run that by the Federation. <laughs> uh, but the next thing, the next thing I, I said was, I don't have any backup. And uh, at that moment, my eyes were drawn to that law enforcement memorial, and it was though I had God saying to me, you have your backup. And although I was alone, I didn't feel alone for a minute. I felt like all of those brothers and sisters that had gone before me were there. And sometimes, I think we can get really sad wondering where they are, and I know I have. Um, but I can tell you without a doubt, I knew every one of them was there with me that day and that's one thing I can say about cops is that I don't think we ever quit doing our job. We just end up doing police work on the other side. Thank you. As you can see these are extraordinary officers rose to the occasion in truly extraordinary situations. At this time, I'd ask all the past Medal of Valor Award recipients, would you please rise as we commend these newest members to a truly elite circle of great officers. And all the past MOV winners, please stand. Let's give them a round of applause. 